Hey, everyone. Welcome to another amazing segment here with your host, Candice Cordelia for PWI. That is Pro Wrestling Illustrated, in case you didn't know. And today, my guest, and I'm so excited to finally be able to talk with him, the one and only Fest Championship Wrestling, Victor <laughs> Effie. Did I get that right? <laughs> Best hey, no, I think it totally worked. I love it. I'm I'm a true believer that all words are made up anyway. So I think like any introduction <laughs> that brings that up is exciting. And, you know, like Fest, Fest is, is a place that I felt I was allowed to be fully Effie, you know, for, for some of the first few times. And now coming back as we have sort of tried to create a, a safe way to do it, I think most of Fest is taking place outdoors. But we will have this wild wrestling show that sort of takes place in the middle of punk music chaos. And uh, they have told me I'm a wonderful brand ambassador for that sort of function. So I'm happy to bring the belt back in. I don't drink PBR, but there's PBR on the belt, <laughs> lest they forget. Uh, so hopefully they, they seem to be really getting into the social media lately. So I know. Let's see if they're back on, on me with that championship. But I'm excited for that. I mean, Halloween weekend. Yes. I, and I'm personally excited for fall. Fall is my favorite season and I'm ready for Halloween. I'm not even going to front about that. So we are excited to see what you're going to be into for the next, what is it? Five months. It's crazy how time is flying. 2020. Yeah. We're through a lot of 2021. I think, I think we don't make that realization until fall of like how much we've already had of the year. Cause like, for me, you know, you, you start in this sort of wintry thing of like, what is this year? And especially this year, it's like, what is this year? You're aiming for that vaccine. Please vaccinate me. Let me go get a booster if I need it. Like all of these things are happening at once. And when you get into the summer, you sort of pedal to the metal. And I think as we enter the fall and as we sort of uh, pair into, there's a different busyness to fall and it's a more focused, I think it's a more uh, thoughtful of, of where you've been so far. And so I'm excited to see, like, I think my work always changes with that, like with the seasons, with the time, with what's going on, I let it do that. So it's like the way I'm wrestling or how I'm acting or how I'm showing up to a show, especially as we're starting to travel a little more and explore into places. Um, I like to see what happens with me because I'm just going to, I'm going to go with whatever feels right in those places and those times. And when you get into the fall, there's just that feeling of like, let's, let's really bunker down this year and let's make sure we hit every note we wanted to hit this year. You know, you can kind of check back over everything. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And it's really interesting that you bring up uh, just the renewal of the new season going into fall and winter. You always strike me as a wrestler who is really into just going with the flow. And you've talked about this in other interviews, especially with this whole improvisational type. I don't know if I want to call it technique, but it's something that you seem to filter into your work. Do you mind talking more about improv and just how you use improvisation as a wrestler and in your matches? Um. The other day I was listening, this is where we get big brain and we're going right into it, Candace. Yes. I was listening to Rick Rubin, the music producer. And like, if you don't know his music production, you do, but also you've probably seen him in the front row of a WWE show, big, wild beard. I mean, he's a crazy looking guy, but he really loves pro wrestling and he really loves music. And hearing him talk to Mark Marin about how wrestling is just sort of this, it's this caricature of everything we deal with in everyday life and every sort of um, structure that we see at play, whether it be sort of the, the fights of government or these obvious like old school jingoism fights where you had these really patriotic or really uh, antithesized characters. But we've done that into a more emotional scale now. And there's so many different presentations of wrestling that I think if it comes from that pure sport aspect are also still mimicking these aspects of real life. When we see true competition and the emotion that pulls out of people, when you're going in to replicate that in your sport, you're still replicating parts of the outside world. And so at the core, like the improv of it is that for me, everything's always changing. There's always something new. There's always a new narrative. There's always something new that's being presented to us from a ton of different places and sources. So when you're thinking on your feet and you're thinking in those scopes right then, it can really add to the live effect, I think. And I think having those cultural references of a room of things that are happening now or telling narratives in that way and moving in that way of 
you know, we planned for this, but, you know, something clicked in a way we didn't think don't fight those things. It's important to bring that back to the live audience. And I think it was a skill that like wrestling really held to the heart for a long, long, long time. I mean, for generations and and generations of people who were uh, practicing this skill, not necessarily on TV, but doing these big live events or or working for certain people and, and back in those territory days. I think that that skill now isn't as valued when we look at what the sort of mainstream goals are that that improvisation, it helps in all of those ways, but it's not the thing that they're seeking anymore. But I want to be a a sort of live event. Um, I want to be something you have to tell your friends about. And I want to create those moments. And I see it a lot with GCW. And sometimes just being on the fly with those things really brings your audience in and cuts away at, there is a, it cuts away at a wall of uh, they know they're being played to. They know this is a performance, but there's a slight human wall that you can cut through when you're able to just slide around and move on the fly. I know that's like a long answer for that, but those things are, I mean, it's, it's how I think. And like, I put a heavy value on that and sort of being able to meet any opponent in the middle, when you have those improvisational skills, no matter if things go exactly how you plan, your goal at the end of the day is to, cohesive you know become cohesive enough with this person you need that improv Mm -hmm. you need it yeah and and that's why i i mean when i first started watching wrestling that's one of the main things that i gravitated towards when i was watching you know wwe and other promotions it's the whole soap opera improv it's a storyline it's not just the athleticism for me it's the the actual storylines that really gripped me do you think there's a part of that that's missing in mainstream wrestling, I'm not even going to go into the indie side of things, but with mainstream, do you think that there needs to be a change in terms of how storylines are presented, especially when it comes to improv? You see, I had to take a sip of water for this one. (laughs) (laughs) What is so hard for me to see and where I have exchanged my energies, I'm a person who knows like this week, especially I had to take a day to myself because I was emotionally exhausted. I I had been through the ringer in a lot of different ways and getting to these times. And I had a day and I said, I've got to cool it out because this is, I'm not going to direct this in the right way. And I refocused and I made a list and I got productive. And that's how I had to take my anger and focus it. When I see people who get really, really in depth with some of the storylines that they're being presented on television, when I see how much thought they put into it, how much of themselves they put into it, how much they hope that they are looking for these little connections and looking for these things to make sense. And wouldn't it be incredible if that wasn't just something that happened, or they were actually planning ahead for this and they were actually paying attention to these minute character details and they were paying attention to these little things instead of week after week, when you are presenting these options amongst each other with fervor and with excitement, what is being presented in their office is, I don't like that anymore. What's the next thing? I don't know. Go over here. Do that instead. There is no focus or hold on these things. And even if writers and performers are putting themselves into it, and even if the fans are putting this energy into it, these things being cut off without conclusion or without exploration really kills a lot of what the the nuance could be in these situations. And to say that there aren't audiences seeking nuance right now is insane because I think about the television shows I want to watch. I love True Detective. I love Westworld. I love, you know, uh, I, there's shows I, I, you know, I want to watch sometimes that are just like Guy Fieri exploring restaurants. And that's that's a vibe for me. If you're not looking at what's drawing people in and what's hooking people and what is holding people and trying to see how you can offer some of those same benefits and seeing how you can meet your audience there, clearly there is a smart television audience. It's not just uh, every family in the country turns on Andy Griffith and learns a lesson. We have a way to seek out exactly what we want in entertainment. And for me, wrestling in a big sense, is the core of entertainment. It is the most raw form of acting. There is no rawer form of theater. Uh, I would argue it forever and ever. But as we present to mainstream audiences who are clicking through and have selection, not honoring their uh, intellect that many times over and over is unforgivable when you're asking people to give your product to try again. You can't at one moment claim it's for children and then at another moment try full nightmare scenario and do something so dark or so sinister that 
it's guaranteed to feel adult and, and not being able to stick to anything at any point makes it so that it's hard for anyone else to stick to it. They've got some of the most incredible wrestlers in the entire world. Their roster is stacked to the brim. You look at the WWE, the talent is, it's unbelievable. And it's, we're, we are all starting to open up more about the core of the issue. And I think people who have been inside have a better understanding than I do. But I also have a lot of conversations with people who are more willing to talk and discuss things now that for years because of the machine wouldn't do it. We, we've got to find a new audience and they're willing to come with us. And I'm seeing it at the live shows I'm at, but they're not following us when it gets to that level because they don't want to be insulted. And the people who are sticking around and feeling insulted I think that their energies could be better put into something that would reward them and give them something back. And so that's always the goal is to go wrestling can be rewarding. We can give you reward on this. I can have subtle storylines with a ton of wrestlers all across this country and even the world through social media. And these things can build. And if you want to pay attention, we can give you that. And as we grow distribution uh, and as we get into more places in an easier scape, their sell is going to be harder forever. And they're never going to be able to recover in time because they didn't jump ahead of the curve. They sold it off or got distribution that looks great. Or they're in 56 million homes with Peacock, but who cares? And what archive is there? And what did you lose of what brought you to uh, brought people to you in the first place? I'm wild style today, aren't I? And I'm here for it, Effie. This okay, is thank you. What I wanted. <laughs> this is this is the crux of, or one of the main issues that a lot of people are really mulling over when it comes to the wrestling industry. And with the year and a half going on, two years that we've had with this global pandemic, do you feel like the pandemic itself was a major catalyst in really opening people's eyes up to, you know, all of these things that we're now really starting to discuss about wrestling? I, I keep thinking about the fact that like Conan O'Brien and Stephen Colbert were doing the late shows on Zoom like we're doing right now. Like they were in their living room vibing on Zoom. Great lighting, a makeup kind of instructional, I'm sure, but mostly whatever cameras they could get sent in this pandemic. And there's sort of a level of the playing field where at this point in wrestling, everybody's making these customs wrestling matches. We're all in warehouses without audiences with just rings and the background behind it, you know, I'll still say it. I putting those poor wrestlers in front of giant zoom screens with all of these big headed people behind them. We're looking at a time where a size hasn't mattered in wrestling in a long time. And you have these people who are supposed to be larger than life. And you have all the options in the world of digital technology and 3d and printing and whatever they've got budget area access to in their warehouses to be able to do anything they want. And instead they make normal people's heads bigger and put them in front of people who are historically smaller than their other talent. It is bananas to see these people fighting in front of this big, weird zoom meeting. And the fact that they went in that direction, you keep looking and going, everyone thinks it's the monolith, but when bad ideas like this get through and good ideas get kind of tossed out, at a certain point, it's it's it meets in the middle, and you find that like someone's going to point out that this is not a, a a way to to stay ahead of the curve. And watching that to me, and not hearing everyone else go like this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. I mean, there was an acceptance from audiences that what was going to be different was going to be different. But to see what independent wrestling was doing and the risks that were being taken there visually and with event spaces and with types of shows and uh, seeing the way they adapted in almost much better lights and seeing the growth like in Twitch per se, you know, when I can get a lot of people to come watch wrestling with me and show that weird type of wrestling and show this wrestling that's coming out at the same time that looks really good. And there are people interested in art who are coming to independent wrestling and trying to make it look really good. It's leaps and bounds. And when you're presented with that same information, the consumer is starting to make the choice to go in another way and not their consumer. Their consumer is down. The confusion they have is that I, and when I say I, I mean a larger scope. There's a lot of us indie creators and a lot of people I could point to. The people we're bringing in aren't 
WWE fans. They're not coming from WWE to us. They may be lapsed in a sense, but none of their money was going in that direction. These are people who are coming in who would never go in that direction, who are learning about it through this, and they're becoming diehards, and they're seeing growth in this, and they're seeing that we take it very seriously, and it's not that we're taking an audience for them. We're creating an audience that they couldn't get anyway. Very, very intriguing, for sure. And I mean, with the independent scene, in your viewpoint, where do you see things headed? I'm not even going to say the next five years, within the next year, going into 2022. What are your thoughts on that? I see people who are, uh, and I'm speaking uh, slightly vaguely in some senses, but with with sort of the the forbidden door situation being pulled down, I see a lot of excitement and a lot more presentation in those directions. But I think it is good to open that door in a different sense and make sure that people are getting that experience of travel and indie work and getting out on the road and having some of these uh, matches and experiences in places that are less than the perfect situation because a lot of the people that are coming in are from television wrestling. They've learned in these product warehouses and in these facilities, and they've learned a lot of really good stuff, but to get out and get ahead and get those reps in when they're not under TV camera, it's going to increase uh, the draw that we can get out on the independence and we can work together to do that. But it is also going to increase their confidence and their work skill where it's going to pay dividends for them in the long run. There's a lot of guys who the only complaint I hear about being a part of these companies is the lack of the wrestling they're getting to do. And the training is good and they're running in the ring and they're probably doing a lot of practice work. But when you're limited to these TV engagements, I think it takes away from what we can get out of these performers. And like, I'm not a fool. I'm not going to wrestle until I'm 80 years old. I don't think, but I don't know because you know, I'm doing a program right now with Ricky Morton and he's more fired up than I've ever seen him. And seeing the fact that we are able to create these situations between generations and that now the looseness and uh, openness of some of these companies and their contracts is creating more of these dream situations. This can move into a really good event space that is bigger than what their companies are. I don't think Ring of Honor is drawing well ticket wise, but their roster is incredible. I think if you look before the pandemic, it's not a secret. They weren't drawing well ticket wise, but they have an incredible roster. What can we do on our end to get them back in the seat where they can do things like like sell out, you know, massive arenas and get people excited in that way? And is it do we help them with the formatting of it's hard to sit through a full TV taping three times and the pay-per-view setup and everything can we get more of them out in the world? And it seems like with the PWG show last night, they are. It's just when wrestling has more wrestling, there's more to do with wrestling. And I say this as an independent person. And so obviously it's that he's going, oh, he's saying all the TV guys should come do the indies. I, I hope you don't feel it selfishly because it's like, I'm good. I know what I'm doing. I'm in my zone. We're building a lot of big things, but I don't think that we should limit anybody's talent right now, especially when people are in great shape, are ready to wrestle, are ready to do it, the more they can get out and, you know, in the right situations where things are good for them and they're not limiting their, uh, they're not risking a lot if if they're doing these shows more than getting in front of these people, getting that experience, getting that workflow when they may not necessarily be needed while they're under contract all the time. I want to see more of that. And I think it also helps the guys out on the independence grow because it keeps that high level I don't think there's a as big of a level difference between these companies anymore than there has been because there's all these avenues to make money now. So it's it's not even about that really anymore of we have to get the greatest of the greats out here. I think that we can all benefit. And I that's that's a simpler version of it. We can all benefit by working together. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned Rick and Morton. I mean, before we did this interview, breaking news came out about Ric Flair requesting leaving WWE. So Times are definitely changing and we're seeing real legends and icons that are taking their careers in a different level. And they're saying, you know what, this is what you know me as. I've done this for umpteen years, but now I'm ready for a change. So everything that you're saying, it makes sense. And I don't know how many people know this about you. I researched, of course, and did my legwork. And one thing that I loved about your biography is the fact that you studied PR, public relations, which I find really cool. And you can tell, or at least I can, because the way that you express your passion for the business, and I can tell you have a real great mind for it. 
Um, it seems like everything that you've learned from public relations and your studies, you've really put that into your own career in terms of branding, marketing, and all of that. What's one thing when you stepped inside of the wrestling business for the first time and you were looking around, you were at your first couple of matches, having studied PR, what's one thing that you saw that you were just like, I, I don't, I don't vibe with this. I don't know what this is all about. That's like a, that's a really big wide open question. Cause it was, it was such a shock, but I also was of a younger mind where I had, I had, uh, I had resume in other fields, but coming into wrestling, I still felt like, okay, well, this isn't my world right here. But I think what was like really marvelous was just like the level of uh, sort of obsessive ability of work out of these people that you were getting where they weren't being paid anything. They weren't being promised anything. They were showing up and they were getting in front of, of people just to have a chance to be looked at, just to have a chance to be tasted by these people who were they were being told were the almighty. They were going to make all the decisions of your career. They were going to be the deciders of where you went. They were going to be everything. And so you sort of right away go, I don't know if that guy's all powerful. When people are coming in, they're like, that's the guy he's going to like, he's going to make your, make or break your career over there. And you're sort of looking around, you go, I've met a lot of cats in my day. And I don't know if this is the cat that's going to make or break it. And seeing that sort of blind loyalty right away, you go, okay, well, I don't want to push the bucket too much, but if we, sort of overstep some of these people who think they're in charge, but aren't necessarily really in charge. What do we find on the other side instead of stepping narrowly around them? And I, I had to experiment it for myself. Obviously, you know, you're jumping in and you're getting there in some ways. I didn't come from a real school. Anyway, I'd been training with, you know, white trash Fred in a, in a field. And so when I was coming into these shows, I didn't have a reputation. I didn't have anyone backing me up. It was sort of a, how do I get in here? How do I make it count? And how do I work with people in a way that makes them want to do the right thing? And it's it's a weird long path, but like noticing right away that there is a, an immediate blind loyalty into these things, it's figuring out how you kind of break that cycle a little bit and really treat it as a business. Uh, that's been the very hardest thing. And I think it'll be like the end mission. You know, it's like, don't don't let anyone use you up for free because you're worth a little bit and you're bringing something in. And if they're, you know, if they're eating that big prime rib buffet, <laughs> we got to have a conversation. Same, same. And for you, one thing that a lot of your fans and, and the wrestling industry as a whole really appreciates is the fact that you've introduced Effie's big gay brunch, which is huge now. So talk to me about the origination of this idea and how it came to just materialize. Um, there had been a lot of gay shows, obviously, and a lot of people trying to do gay shows and a lot of, you know, pride shows and whatnot. And I, I felt the spirit of, you can't deny it, like the spirit of Joey Janela doing spring break. I was in that room for the first one in Orlando. And I was just like, what is happening? And Paro was helping out at that show. And I was like, Paro, what is happening? And so thinking about that party vibe and what queer people and LGBTQ people bring to that party and our specific brand of party, and then using it as sort of a platform for, hey, look at these people you may not know about and putting them in positions where they can succeed. I think all those things together, it's like it became a no brainer for me. And I put it out there, you know, obviously as a wink nod of like, who's going to get it. But GCW stepped up and said, look, what you're doing is sick. We And the beauty is they go, we really don't know what we're doing when it comes to the LGBTQ community. Please help us. And when you have people whose voices you trust and seeing the relationships that have been built out of it, you know, obviously me and Allie are very close with GCW, but seeing uh, the relationship with Dark Sheik and what she's doing in Las Vegas and Oakland and on the West Coast and seeing them connect has been magical. Seeing the connection with Edith Surreal and what, what uh, she's been doing, uh, seeing frontman jaw and devon monroe continually brought in and used and seeing even billy dixon being brought in for things like commentary once they understood that adaptability of gcw comes in and i think it will continue to come in in a sense of if it's good we want to put it out there and get it out to people and so being put in that position is awesome and i love doing the shows but i will say this i putting my name on that is the dumbest thing <laughs> I ever did in my whole life. It is the toughest spot to be in. And I know this is like 
the queen's on the throne crying with her big show with her happy smile. But like, it's a very hard position to be in to go, okay, I am upholding the standard of what I think is the best show I can put on what I think is the best show for representation, who I think are the people that need to be in this spot right now. And I think of it this way, and this sounds horrible because RuPaul fracks and I'm over it. And my boyfriend told me to stop talking about RuPaul fracking. He said, stop, stop poking her. She's too powerful. I said, okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Ru- <laughs> RuPaul got the deal with Paramount Plus to bring All Star 6 to Paramount Plus. Only to Paramount Plus. If you're subscribed to Paramount Plus, you get All Star 6. The gays are going to subscribe. But what was brought on was a fairly familiar, very recent cast, which is typical for All Stars, but some old favorites brought in because they know what works for TV. A reintroduction. And for a lot of people, they're seeing RuPaul pop up on the front page if they're getting Paramount Plus anyway. This is the big, we have to show America what this show really is. It is the most polished version. Let's give it out. I have to do that show this time. And I want it to be that all-star show. And I want to put the people you've seen in the right spots. And I want the people to shine. And I love the ridiculous aspect of what I do. And you can look for that in me. But I also want to give these all-stars the shine to say, look, if this is your first time in, which a lot of people are saying, this is my first, my first, my first, my first. And it makes sense after this sort of pandemic time. And even coming in to stream with us, for the first time is awesome. So I want to give them the best show I can give them. And when you have all these new queer talents, when you have so many LGBTQ members coming into the world of wrestling and making their voices heard and being out and proud now, it sucks that the show can't be six days long. And I love to see that there are all these opportunities growing up across these coasts and more shows popping up, which is awesome. But it is like, it is a thing that weighs heavy on me of like, I can't get everybody in at once, but I want to put on the best show possible. If you're not here, it doesn't mean you're not worth it. But if you are here, it means I think you're about to blow up and I need you to show out and show the world what we've got on our little island that we don't get stuck on anymore as much, but it is still our island. And I want to show that out, you know? Yeah. And so was there ever a point when you got too many submissions from people where you were just super overwhelmed and you're thinking okay, everyone wants to be a part of, of Epi's Big Gay Brunch. I can't have everyone on this one show. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Uh, it, yeah, it's overwhelming, but it's great. And it, I keep a tab on everything. And like, I really try to pay attention to everything that's going on in indie wrestling, top to bottom. I think that there is uh, a real pulse to, when I look at guys like Joey Janela or Jimmy Lloyd, or um, even guys like Shane Mercer, guys like... Uh, I'm trying to think, you know, some of the West Coast. I mean, everybody's on the lookout, not just to pull what is the next big thing, but of where wrestling's headed and where it's going and what is popping off and what is connecting. When you've got your nose like all the way down to the pulse, you can really feel where wrestling is going to go right before it goes there. And seeing things that are completely different that we wouldn't have expected four or five years ago, um, it's awesome to see the clash of that. And I want to lift the people to the right position where they can succeed. But I also know that when there are people who are putting in that grind elsewhere and making their name known elsewhere and doing their thing, sometimes those moments, uh, you got to time them perfectly. And I think we're going to get some big moments and I, I hope it, I hope it pops off. Chicago is a great place. I've always had fun in Chicago. I know it's Hoffman estates, but <laughs> listen, it's uh Chicago is like a, it's a second or third home for me for sure. Uh, what's your favorite? Chicago um okay Chicago reminds me this is gonna sound so horrible (laughs) if New York was like nicer and a little cleaner and so just walking around you're like it's like that but they're very nice here and I want the meanness of New York I need the attitude I need the shoulder bump I need the watch where you're going but when you're in Chicago you kind of go oh okay I feel that I do feel that. And they have the best Mexican food in the world. Isn't that crazy? Chicago has great Mexican food. I've always heard about the deep dish pizza, but I've never had Mexican food in Chicago. So now I Yeah. Well, maybe it's not the best, but it is like the sloppiest to eat at 2.30 a.m. with the loudest music in the world. It, what an, it, it's the best environment I've eaten Mexican food in. That's what you want. That's what you want. And speaking of locations, um, because you're mentioning Chicago, you're based in Atlanta now, right? You're in Georgia. So yes, what a dream. (laughs) 
that's what it seems like. It seems like you're just perfect. You're in the perfect space for right now. And because Georgia is, I haven't been to Atlanta, but the stories I hear, it's, it's a magical place, you know? And- it's so kicked back. Now I will say this. We have, we have some violent issues in Atlanta. There are things we are always going to be dealing with in urban situations. Mm-hmm. And I think there's stuff that gets exacerbated because it is Atlanta and they want to have these stories pushed in a certain narrative. But my experience with Atlanta is that it is so fun, so friendly. Uh, it is gay. It is vibrant. It is very diverse. I ride the train to the airport. It goes right into the terminal. I walk through that thing. I will say this. The craziest I've seen that airport, Kanye did his first listening party last week. And I was there Friday morning at the airport, like right at seven. And it was the longest I've ever seen the general like TSA line, like through all of baggage claim, it was insane, but it wasn't like angry. It was, everybody was good. We figured out, we have to just wait in these freaking lines and it was chill and everybody was in spirits. It was kind of like a wild time because everybody was just like, we're going to be in these lines. Let's just be in these lines. Exactly. Exactly. Now you're hearing all these stories about how people that work at the airports and the airlines, they're really, they're being trained to just defend themselves due to the the quote unquote anger that a lot of yeah. passengers are, are expressing. So to hear that, I'm, I'm all the, that. yeah, I feel like there's a, a more laid back feel in Atlanta where we're like, look guys, we know the airport gets a little hectic, just cool it with us. It's not a big deal. I will say this, and I don't want people to take this the wrong way. Cause it's not, there's, it's not a negative thing. When I come back from any show and a lot of times, like I'm getting a little wild sometimes, especially these days coming back, I get off the plane train. And I, if you, If you're ever there, I will say, do you know why they call it the plane train? Because I think that's funny. You come up this escalator if you're coming out of the Atlanta airport. There is a very, very big picture of Cody and Brandy right there. And I'm coming up this escalator and I'm like sometimes bleeding. And I've been through these crazy shows and I've you know been a bit of an outlaw bad boy. And I look up and I see the golden face of television and the like, here's here's this wrestling world. And it's me just kind of like looking down at my bag and going you're in a whole nother planetary dimension right now, brother. It, it sort of aligns you back into like, don't, don't lose, don't lose the vision of everything around here, but it's hilarious just to come up on that. And I'm like, I, I didn't even sleep last night. Where are we? I don't know. <laughs> it's a deep, I have to have a deep moment every time I come up that and uh, take notice. That's amazing. Are you going to partake in their reality show? Are you going to check that out by any, by what any- channel does that come on? I don't even think they've announced it yet, but it's happening. It's it's I don't even know if it's going to happen later this year, possibly next year. It seems as though we're all in wait to to find out. Yeah, I imagine they want to get some stuff filmed up, though. Yeah. But, you know, I'm I what I do find funny is, you know, I'm in the same general area, obviously. And so a lot of times people end up over here who have just been over there. And sometimes I think we have different advices on stuff. And so I think it's good for people uh, I'm like, I'm like the other Atlanta. So they come through there, they come through here, they can make the choice on their own. They figure it out on, on their own. Uh, it's, it's the whole nother environment down here in Atlanta. And I'd like to see more wrestling take place in the city limits of Atlanta, because I think that has dwindled in the last few years. And I think that they can make it, make it happen. Yeah. yeah. We're looking. What's the scene overall like in, in Atlanta? I know it's popping in the South, but it's, does Atlanta, overall have a really heavy wrestling scene right outside of uh the 285 corridor so you know outside the big circle of the city there's a ton of good wrestling and you know there's you've got southern honor up in the north you've got wrestling action down in the south even you know uh, athens is not too far and has some good stuff but as far as atlanta proper you know atlanta wrestling entertainment used to run it and if you look back at some of their cards it's incredible but it, as far as releasing some of this stuff, they never really got around to doing it in a great way. And so a lot of it went missing. I don't know if they promoted the right way in there, but they ran really cool venues. They ran Atlanta in a way people hadn't uh, that was, you know, had women and had black people and had queer people. And it was very cool at that time. But I think you have to approach Atlanta in a different way where there's so much going on in Atlanta anyway. There's so much happening all the time in Atlanta that you almost have to feed into stuff that is already a happening and already going on to be allowed to exist in that scene. And so the the collaboration that I think wrestling sometimes is a little afraid of is something that would help out tremendously in building up on these scenes. And I think if you kind of look around the country, people that aren't scared to collaborate in more of these outside the box ways are starting to see success 
And there is a general spirit, more of this kind of party wrestling vibe that appeals to people right now who have been stuck in the house, have been stuck around, have had not not the biggest, uh, most fun time of their life at any point in the last year or so. So it's I think there's a vibe that you can meet with people that you will find success, but it is outside of this wrestling sort of regular brain that we have nowadays of it. Mm -hmm. What's one cultural scene of Atlanta that you would love to actually see merged with wrestling? Oh, the like the skating scene. There's so many great skate parks around Atlanta and it, it lends itself to a lot of different kinds of, uh, you know, skaters and styles. And I see their their venues are usually attached to these parks and they're attached to these cool areas where we could fit in and we could fit in with their scene. And most of these skate parks are built into larger scapes of the city and larger parts of that area. And it's not just that they're the skate scenes. I, you know, I used to live right along the Beltline, which is this walking loop that goes around the whole city. It's incredible. And there's so many stops along there. But on this particular part where that skate park is, where the bridge is, there's drummers playing, there's big fields, there's open areas, you know, getting permission with the city to say, Hey, I know you have an opinion of what you think wrestling is. You probably had an opinion of what you think skaters are, what you think people at this park are, or what you think uh, artists who are out under the bridge are, but we're obviously not those things. And getting a chance to prove that in that sort of collaboration, I think the artistry of that scene matches so well with what we're doing over here. And I think that we could see a really cool boom and a lot of willingness to collaborate that would end up in a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, that would be sick. I mean, we're seeing it with Darby Allen at All Elite Wrestling, but also, oh, yeah. I mean, skating is becoming mainstream again. I know growing up, it was this huge, you know, counterculture scene. And I'm from Philly, and skating has always been huge in Philly. But I'm personally loving the fact that it's becoming mainstream for the Olympics. I mean, we have Betty. I don't know if you've heard of Betty on HBO, which is a show about women's or young female skaters. So I'm oh. all for that. I'm really all for the merging of the two worlds. Yeah, but it's, it feels like, and this is obviously biased on my part, the more I'm hearing about skating, I'm hearing about it because of the inclusion of women, the inclusion of queer women, the inclusion of trans people, the inclusion of everyone being allowed to be a part of this skating world that historically was like a good old boys club. Oh, does this sound like a metaphor for anything? And so that sort of level of like, look at how it's working everywhere. When you let everyone join the team, when you let everyone be a part of it, you are allowed a bigger growth than you could imagine. And so, yeah, I think we're really onto something here, Candace. We, we might be, we might have to patent this one. Yes. Let's I'm the copyright, the patent I'm, I'm on it. Warp tour left a hole. We can fill this yes. hole. I think it, yeah. we don't need pop punk anymore. Just skating <laughs> and wrestling. This is true. That was such a huge part of my world too, the whole part right? when I was younger, but yeah, yeah, I'm for it. So, you know, it's no surprise that you have been a leader for just spearheading diversity in all forms when it comes to wrestling. But where do you see things headed, especially within the LGBTQIA community? We're talking about skating and all of these different cultures that could be informed in wrestling. But in terms of LGBTQ+, how much further does the community have to go to really succeeding even more in wrestling in general? This is the awesome part. It's me getting out of the way. I love that you're like, hey, you're spearheading diversity. I think in a sense that I'm just the loudest and I have a lot of privilege and I will never deny that. I'm a grown ass man. I'm a cisgender man. I can, if I feel like walking into a business meeting, I know that I have the ability to live my little straight fantasy for 20 minutes and trick anyone I wanted. That is all privilege. And me choosing to be a loud ass, no holds bar. I don't care what your power is. I'm going to call you out on that. That is something where you go, I have this privilege. If I don't do this, I'm going to feel pretty shitty. And having that level of transparency, what we need to do now is shift away from the cisgender voices and the white voices and open up to people and say, Hey, you don't need my permission to have power and control of the room. You don't need my permission to lead the voice first, it's us getting out of the way and now being able to step aside and go, we can still offer you all of these things that may help in your vision and your quest, but we also don't want to be in the way of what the new wave is and what the changes are. And I I don't think I'm a person who's going to leave wrestling in a sense entirely, but 
when I look at where my performance needs to go, like my whole point is to poke these bubbles and poke these people out and scare these people a little bit and, and scare them into doing the right thing when that is more useful behind the scenes and the voices that need to be ahead are put in that spot. I'm all for being completely out of the way and doing whatever that backup work is like, I'm completely ready for that. And it excites me too, because not being a forward facing person after, you know, a certain point, not that I won't, and not that I'm running from it, but putting yourself in the position to go, you know what, maybe, maybe I step a little back on this. That's awesome because it's, it takes away from me thinking I have all the things to say. And, and you listen a lot better when you're not having to lead, when you're not having to be in front. And I think being able to step back and hear all the people that I'm, I'm publicly saying, I think they have the ideas and I think they have the future. Let them say it, let them have it, you know, let me hear it. Let me learn, you know, what are the things I'm not even noticing, you know? Yeah. I mean, who are some of those wrestlers that people should be aware of? I know there's a ton of names. There's a whole huge list and it seems as though the community is getting bigger and bigger, which is fantastic. Um, but in your opinion, who are some of those names that you want to shout out and and just let people know these are the, this is the future and these are the people that you should be uh, taking heed of? Yeah. Uh, Trisha Dora, Karen Bam Bam, Edith Surreal, Dark f- Chic. I will not censor myself because she is taking on Nick Gage in Los Angeles. Dark Chic, the, the mother of the House of Hood Slam, the mother of the Church of Wrestling, a real organized religion, is taking on Nick f- Gage in Los Angeles. That is the future, not just because of how she performs and what her journey has been, but because she kicks so much ass and and never takes from anyone and does her and seeing the window that she's gotten now a little bit and seeing her run with it fires me up to infinity, fires me up to infinity. I said Karen Bam Bam earlier because she is a leader and she is one of the most entertaining wrestlers I've watched in years. Uh, and I said, Trisha Dora, Trisha Dora is incredible. And Trisha Dora has a confidence in herself to never, I've never seen that girl bend at the knee. And that is the coolest shit to me ever. And I don't know how else to put it. And I hope that reads respectfully. I don't see her bend at the knee. She doesn't take, she's, she's in it. Yes. Is my discord yes. going crazy? Jeez Louise. <laughs> You're good. And I'm so here for everyone that you mentioned. And you know, with Nick Gage, I would love to know your thoughts about seeing him mainstream because that shocked a lot of people seeing him show up at all elite wrestling. What do you think about that? All right. Here's, I'm going to explain this by not even explaining the the question you asked and you're going to know exactly what I mean. Mm -hmm. All right. Somebody said, how does Nick Gage do all these dumb comedy matches and he gets away with it and he's never affected by it. And I said, because at no point, in any match is he not Nick Gage. Nick Gage is Nick Gage all the way through. Nick Gage knows when he's in the match when to turn it up, but Nick Gage out of the ring, Nick Gage in the ring, Nick Gage is always Nick Gage. He's 100 with his fans, he's transparent with his fans, he's real with the people of the world, and he's even realer when he's in the ring and he's telling you what's going down. That is Nick Gage through and through. When you ask about Nick Gage mainstream, how does it affect Nick Gage? How does Nick Gage react? We were in Las Vegas, This is the night after the Vice documentary. I've told this story and I don't know where and I don't care, but I'm telling it to you because it's brief. I'm walking around a casino with Nick Gage and a couple other people. I go up to the bartender. I get a Diet Coke and I say, Nick, what do you want? He says, I want a Miller Lite. I said, perfect. So the Diet Coke and a Miller Lite. And the bartender says, excuse me, sir, is that Nick Gage? And I said, yes, yes, it is. And I said, Nick, this guy knows you. And of course, it's Nick. What's up, MDK? It's Nick Gage. I'm not going to replicate what he said. And the bartender says, What's up? Gives him the drink. And he looks at me and he goes, I just learned about that guy last night. That's the craziest story I've ever seen. I can't believe that man is standing in front of me right now. And Nick understood it. I'm not saying he didn't, but when it clicked in my brain, of he just reached a group of people who are hearing the most incredible story I've ever heard in my life. And I get to call him a friend and a uh, and a an opponent, and historically, you can't ever take that. That's like a thing that's eternal with us. And to hear these people be like, 
holy shit, I can't believe I'm seeing this person. And I just learned about them from the TV show. It blew my mind and it blew my mind, the reach that he is going to get now. And that positivity and honesty from Nick Gage means so much to people. And people aren't kidding when they say he's, he's the R rated John Cena. And I think John Cena uh, has made a path of his own way, but, but that Nick Gage bond, Oh, there's nothing like it. It's magic. Wow. That, I mean, that's just a testament to the wide reach that these documentaries on Vice has. And I, I can relate to that because I only knew a little bit about Nick Gage's background just based on, you know, things that people would tell me in terms of his death matches, but I didn't know the full on story. So when I personally watched that, I was blown away because the same way the bartender reacted, I'm thinking, how are you still here? That's just a miracle in and of itself and still yeah. what you do and loving what you do. That's it's unreal. So thank you for that because that's an amazing response. <laughs> yeah. When well, outside of that, when you bring up the documentaries, I think what's yeah. interesting is when people come from these serious media worlds who take what we do seriously, as seriously as we do, you see really intense, great results. And having that vision of, instead of saying, you need to do what this is because that's what wrestling is. And that's what the advertisers want and saying we think wrestling can be seen through this lens and can reach people in a whole different way while it is still wrestling. That is magic. And I think more people are going to catch on to that sort of, when you take us seriously in that way, we can, we can really connect with people. There's true human stories in here. Absolutely. And that also reminds me of the interview that you did uh, for Renee Young's podcast with Lita. And I, I loved listening to that whole interview or rather conversation, to be quite honest, it was fantastic. But it just, when you were talking about growing up in the South and the Southeast and how wrestling where, I mean, in your opinion, from that focus to seeing how people are gravitating to wrestling now, folks who have never watched wrestling that are just latching onto it and really loving it. Um, and, and seeing, you know, the bartender with the story that you just proposed, you know, people like that who are just like, you know, I'm loving wrestling. I've never been into it before, but I'm loving it. What do you feel about that? Like, how does that make you feel in terms of, of you being a wrestler and being able to have that reach to people who have never watched it before in their lives? Yeah, I think if you look back historically, wrestling, wrestling, when it started to get a little TV access, there were a lot of people peering into wrestling that maybe wouldn't feel comfortable coming into the actual shows. And I think that wrestling fandom has always been probably more diverse than we've recorded, but it is sort of people watching from that distance or watching from a place of safety. They, they deem safety. And now as people go, Oh, like, wait a second, this is like a wild queer show, or this is a show for just black wrestlers, or this is a show where, where there's just going to be women performers, which there are more of all the time. Having these cool zones of safety and of openness, it's magic because people were already interested. People would have gotten into it bigger or people watched from a distance. And now they're able to express that full force, which opens us up to way more people. When people are allowed to see you be passionate about something, they are going to garner interest in it. And they're going to want to see what the big deal is. When people are going, you can't believe it, what you're going to see, what you're going to do. And they go, well, how often do you go? And they go, as often as I can. You're going, hold on. This is not what I remember wrestling being. These things spread a lot quicker when people are allowed to have their openness enjoyed. And so it's nice to see it sort of come out of its own and for people to uh, feel comfortable expressing themselves when, when it comes to all of these styles of wrestling and uh, wrestling fans are always, I believe, open to what else is new and different. We always give a chance of what comes through that curtain, you know, whether we are loudly booing or loudly cheering it, we always try to give things a chance. And that's why there is that growth of character in wrestling that we've always loved to see over time and why these characters have stuck with us for so long that we're allowed to do that kind of growth we're bringing people in and we can show a different growth to them and a different change to them. And I think we can get them to stick again. And I think we can get them to yell again for yeah. sure. Yeah. Right on. What does your partner think about your career as a wrestler? He's so cool about it. It's insane because we just like, we've of course had our moments where it's like, it sucks. You're not here for the weekend. Like it sucks, but also especially being in Atlanta now and being more open and being out here 
we are able to communicate so wildly and perfectly with each other. And he has his group of friends and he has his times. And of course there's like times I'm too tired to want to do stuff or times where I do stuff where I'm like probably a little grumpier than I should be. But we allow each other that movement of, Hey, if I call you Saturday night after the match, you might be out at the party and that's okay. I'm not going to get you right then just because I need to, Oh, I just finished my match. I need to hear you. You're having your life too. But luckily he also gets to work remote. So we're around each other a lot. We get to spend, you know, most of the weekdays together and the schedule is a little crazier now and a little more long, you know, in between our spots, but we know how to work with each other and it's sick. And also he doesn't really care about wrestling and he has the best quotes about it where he's like, listen, I I can't sit through four hours of something to watch you get beat up for 15 minutes. And I was like, you make a really valid point, baby. Uh, It's good. And he gets to take the dog on adventures. He went to the lake. You know, it's we we make it work. And he's very patient with that. And he knows it's a weird career. But as long as I guess our bills are paid, as weird as it may be, if it works, it works, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And your dog is so cute, Cranberry. So cute. Oh, my God. <laughs> She's so camera shy, though. Every time I put her on the stream, every time I try to take a picture, she's like, don't you dare. She's like, you didn't pay me for this. I'm like, you're so playful usually. And now you're just like. It's intense. She's she's a moody one. Yeah, she's like, I'm behind the scenes. Daddy can, you know, do what he does. Yeah. Out there in front of people. Save it for just me. That's what she wants. It's so precious. So, so precious. (laughs) One thing I also have to ask you is, you know, we're going back to like 2018 punk pro the whole izzy scene that happened (laughs) to be quite honest that was the first time that i really got into what who you were as a wrestler when i saw that viral clip and i was just like what's going on who is who is effie who is izzy why is this happening yeah (laughs) you know fast forward to 2021 do you guys still, I, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, if y'all still talk or you have a certain relationship. And if so, you know, what, what was the last conversation that you guys talked about? You know, the one of the last things we did, she interviewed me for her show, kind of catching up and sort of just being able to see that she's carving her own thing and doing her own path. And like, I joke with her, I go, listen, I go, the only reason the only reason you had any heat after this is because Hunter wanted your first bump. And I think of it in that scope of she kind of got pushed away from pro wrestling by a lot of powerful people in that moment. And they can call me a dingus and an idiot all day. I love it. I, somebody asked me if I had heat after that. I said, is that when your email is so full, you don't even know how to get to all of them. It's not heat. It was magic. It was something different. It was weird. Her grandma high fived me. But seeing that I took something they had put a lot of screen time into and we had done it on our own where this is something they had come to me and asked, you know, her and her dad said, I I think it would be fun and easy and dumb. And I would get my first little match in. And I said, perfect. And we got Leva involved. And the match itself is the most silly, stupid thing you can imagine, but a really fun story through and through. And I think they got bitter and I think they pushed her away. And she still has been able to carve a path with herself and seeing wrestling through her own lens. And so, yeah, we keep up. I make sure she's killing it. Her parents are incredible. I, there was always the rumor of like, her parents are making so much money off of this. Her dad said to me one time, he goes, we sold three shirts tonight, $60. We're getting rich, baby. And I was like, it's the magic of indie wrestling. And people assuming like, oh my God, her parents are making all this money off her and doing all this. It was like, it was absurd and it was crazy. And so it's good to see that she's kind of kept her on control and done her thing. Mm-hmm. If there was any other child that came up to you, you know, in that same age bracket from like 11 to, you know, say 15, they came up to you and said, I want to do what you do. I want to be a wrestler. What advice would you give to them? Cardio, start running, just start running as much as you can. You can't bump until you're 18 years old in my brain. And I know different people just because I got the heat on it. I got the heat on it. So I just say that now I go, don't. Just do all your cardio and do your roll. Roll on the grass a lot. Roll and just roll around all the time. Legally, that's my advice for anyone under 18 who wants to bump in a wrestling ring after all that. <laughs> Fair enough. And roll Proud of Izzy. Izzy. Proud of Izzy. Yes. <laughs> roll in the grass and do cardio, kids. That's a fair enough assessment. That there's my lawyer said that. that. He said, just don't tell kids to fall in the ring. <laughs> Effie told me to take a joke slam. 
<laughs> I feel that. And roll- I don't sign netcasts. Yeah, we don't want that. We don't want that. <laughs> we don't no want way. That. We don't want to see that. My last question for you, and usually I ask wrestlers, you know, what's your dream match? If, if there was someone that you haven't ever wrestled before that you would love to, who would it be? But I'm going to ask you, who would you love to have a rematch with? Oh, that's good. Uh, truly, one-on-one, uh, Ricky Shane Page. I I fought Ricky Shane Page in LA and I think Ricky Shane Page got the best of me in a lot of ways. And I think I'm a different bird now. He's, you know, 50 pounds lighter and more evil than ever. I want to see that clash again. I want to see me and Ricky Shane Page. I want to see it on a big stage though. I want to see people giving a f- about it. And I want to see, you know, us put our energy into it and not have it be just a one-off or a throw-off that leads to something else. I want it to be a, a chunky moment for us, a big meaty moment between me and RSP. I like that. I don't think I was expecting that, but I love it. That's a great, great response. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's a, a genius with his energies in the wrong direction. Hmm. All right. Hopefully we get to And see that's that. the polite way of putting it. <laughs> now I want to see that rematch so bad. That has to happen. Oh. We're throwing it in the universe. Yes. Please. Yes. <laughs> Let's go. Thank you so much, sir, for your time, your amazing responses. It's just super appreciated. And this ticks off something on my list because I've always wanted to interview you. So thank you so much. Well, I hope I, I hope I came through with the knowledge. I was, I felt pretty good about, I wasn't, I wasn't even mean about anything. Was I, I was kind of just like plain straightforward, right? (laughs) You were you. And that's all we can. Okay. Okay. I don't want it to be aggressive. I just, we have to have honest flow of information for the wrestling industry, or we're just going to be in a mess i don't know yeah yeah i'm here for effie thank you so much before we leave please plug your socials you have a twitch channel so definitely yes plug that so more people can watch it i see you're already in twitch mode it seems i i am a little in twitch mode i really want the stream to go well tonight i just got another computer and getting the setup done has it's been crazy and hard but every monday night at eight my anchor stream is monday not raw and it goes on the same time as some other shows, but we watch independent wrestling. We watch all kinds of wild wrestling. Uh, it's it's a open forum for wrestling communication, but there's a lot of independent highlight and talent. We do it for three hours at least. It's a fun time. Effie Lives is the Twitch channel, and that's everything. So my Twitter is Effie Lives. My Instagram is Effie Lives. My uh, Pro Wrestling Tees is Effie Lives. My Cameo is Effie Lives. It's all Effie Lives, but Twitch, Effie Lives, come hang out. You don't have to pay any money to watch. It's free if you just want to come watch. You might get an ad for Michelo Ultra. I don't know. Hey, either way, we're we're, we're loving it. <laughs> either way, <laughs> or maybe PBR. You know, you never know. They're yeah, and they're all on the socials now, so you never know what's going to happen. We'll see yeah. if they want to pop up. Yeah, that would be awesome. But I'm definitely going to check out your Twitch because I I did a little bit dabbling, and I'm I'm loving just your responses to matches and everything. So I think I'm going to have to join in. Uh, yeah. I like that people are asking me to do commentary now. Like that gets me really excited because, you know, technically I'm doing commentary on Monday, not raw, <laughs> but it's also the most stream of consciousness, whatever's happening in the world commentary. And so getting to bring that to an actual wrestling show has been really cool. Enjoy wrestling. Check them out. I did commentary on season one. I was in season two against Willow Nightingale. Pretty insane match. Uh, I'll stop plugging myself now, Candace. <laughs> you got to vote for yourself. You got to be here for yourself. And that's one of the- Oh, I voted. I put, yeah, I, I punched that card. <laughs> well, thank you so much once again, Effie, for showing up and giving us all of this information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in to another fantastic episode of Face Turn with Candace Cordelia, where we have exclusive interviews with some of your favorite wrestlers. Stay tuned for more. Make sure to subscribe on the PWI YouTube channel and you never know who's going to show up next. So keep watching.